a farm with my wife, Rebecca Graff and I were on her family farm. Um, we're in Northeast Clay County. We have about 20 acres that we manage on her uh, family farm, which is about 260 acres total. So we've been farming, this is our 18th year, uh, 17th CSA season. Uh, Rebecca is the fourth generation to farm this land. Um, so we learned, we met uh, um, back east, as they say, at a CSA farm. And um, when we were back there, we learned a lot about the importance of soil health. You know, we'd go to these conferences where there'd be people that have been farming for 20 years, you know, talking about the same things we're talking about today. Uh, I used to be an environmental engineer. Uh, that's my college degree. And so one of the good things about that is that a, a lot of environmental engineering uh, waste treatment is a biological process. So I saw for many, many years just uh, how powerful um, a community, community of microorganisms can be to, um, you know, in that case, manage waste or, you know, so it was a quick conversion to dealing with soil. So this is the farm. Um, we live in the house down in the bottom left corner there. We have a equipment barn, a greenhouse, a high tunnel, a uh, packing room, and a commercial kitchen. Um, like I said, this is, there's about five acres in the field on the left and about maybe 10 or so on the field on the right. Um, but if you look at uh, just the amount of space that's cultivated, we might have maybe six or so acres that can be cultivated. So this is a picture of um, the farm uh, a couple weeks ago. We've comp completely uh, revamped the, how we're going to be managing the farm. Um, you know, uh, Carrie talked about how you know you got soil health, and one of the things you have to do is protect the soil. Uh, there's been too many years lately where you know, might have 10 inches of rain in a week and you know we're on ridgetop land and it really um, the kind of rectangular fields and the way we were farming really wasn't working and so we're um, going to be reshaping the land we put in over a mile of berms and swales and I'll talk more about that later. So the main reason um, way we started farming, which is a CSA farm, um, since we met on a CSA, and it uh, appeared to be a good way, Rebecca felt, to come back to her family land and preserve it. It's a good business model, good community model. Uh, we have a participatory CSA, and so uh, up until this year, because of COVID, our members would come out and they would help with the harvest. So things like beans or peas or just helping us, you know, pick lettuce on a Saturday and wash and pack stuff. Um, need a lot of hands. We had about 150 member CSA at the time this picture was taken. So um, that's another thing, you know, we're talking about community, the community in the soil and above ground. And, um, you know, we started out being focused on the community of people that support the farm. We also have a fermentation business which is about half of our business right now. Um, live culture food. You know, we kind of got into it. We always, I always at least kind of wanted to do some value added food. And I didn't really want to boil water in sterilized jars though. And we realized maybe six or so years ago that, um, that uh, fermenting really was a nat natural extension of all the work that we were doing on the farm to build soil. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that soon too. So feed the soil. So unrehearsed, all three speakers here, we've all used that term. And so hopefully if, uh, that's kind of one of the main things that everybody goes away with from um, this talk. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we're doing things the way we are, and then I'm gonna uh, uh, talk about our 18 years of history of farming and some of the data and things that we've learned. So for us, um, you know, you are what you eat, quite literally, and therefore you are what your plants eat. So uh, we feel that, you know, that's a way to kind of explain to people 
Um, one of the fundamental reasons to farm using uh, organic um, you know, biological methods. You know, the soil is quite literally the, the guts of the plant. Um, as the other speakers have shown, you know, you have organic matter that is, um, you, you uh, work into the soil and it's digested just as food is digested in your own body. And then the nutrients are released and um, either the plant or us take up those nutrients and grow. So it's the same, it's really the same thing. And a lot of it is because um, it's a, a co-evolved symbiosis. You know, uh, we grew up together with microorganisms and so did these plants and the uh, intricacies of um, really life on earth is, is based on this symbiosis. So this, this um, figure, kind of shows how um, that's the case. You know, you got a plant, you get over here on the right, you have the mycorrhizal fungi that we've been talking about. And you can see down here that these uh, fungus, they can actually go all the way into a root hair and um, exchange nutrients. This, this fungus, can, you know, hypha can go, you know, yards, you know, or, you know, longer away from the plant and bring nutrients in. And this is all down in the, in the soil where it's dark, whereas the plant, it has its green matter up above ground and in the light zone and it's getting the energy from the sun and basically um, bringing that energy in the form of the sugars and carbohydrates down underground and there's a kind of a transfer of nutrients. And that's, you know, the way, the way plants grow. Uh, this is kind of another look at it. Um, you know, Dan was talking about uh, plant exudates. So, you know, here on the right, there's a, a root hair, and then you have like this biofilm around it, which is the exudates. And the um, bacteria and the life in the soil can live in there and around the exudates. And that's where the microbial metabolites um, get transferred. So, as I said too, when we first started doing ferments, we, um, you know, we we knew there was, you know, a connection between, you know, what goes on a, on a micro level and a microbiome, and so the more I studied it and tried to explain it in talks, uh, I came across, um, you know, this image, which I think is a pretty good one to show how things are the same. So this is the interior of your, you know, your um, digestive system lining. And uh, on the outside of it, you have a, a mucus layer, which is basically a biofilm. And in that mucus layer, you have bacteria that live. And um, you can see that these, this interface really is the same in a, in a soil world as it is in our digestive system. And so we try and make sure that um, we focus on the health of both of these systems. In our case, we're making these ferments. Lactobacillus is one of the main bacteria that are a, a part of our um, fermentation process. And that's a, a, a probiotic in our digestive system. So like for us, the bacteria that lives in our soil actually lives in us. We're that connected to our land and we feel that's important and we feel it's really, um, at least anecdotally, improved our health even uh, more as we've been uh, farming. So I don't wanna get in too much to the alternative, um, but just wanted to point out, you know, the chemical farming approach. As we say, you are what your plants eat. So if your plant is being fed um, these uh, corrosive chemicals, you know, you're one degree of separation from eating that yourself. You know, you have to wear a glove to touch these things. They're synthetically produced, they're corrosive, um, and it's an entire different system. You know, you read the news or there'll be studies that compare chemical-based uh, farming to organic and they'll say, oh, look, this, you know, apples the, the, got the same nutrients. Well, the thing is that implies that there's an equivalency between the two approaches. And, you know, we feel that that's 
that's just not the case. You know, like I say there, it's like comparing apples and synthetic chemicals. It really isn't the type of thing that you can um, compare. You know, it's like people say you should get a premium for organic. That implies that that uh, both things are the same and, and the organic is just a little bit better. Um, I just think it's important to know that they are fundamentally different and they really um, uh, can't be compared. They're uh, um, not comparable. So, so what do we do? So on our farm, uh, like I said, we're, this is our 18th year farming. We learned a lot about cover crops when we started and that's something that we um, did from the beginning. We received a, um, a sustainable ag uh, development grant back in 2003 from the state of Missouri that helped us pay for our first batch of cover crop seeds and got a manure spreader and some other things. And so we've been uh, cover cropping and using these principles since then. So a diverse diet. So just like we need to eat a diverse diet to be healthy, we feel the soil is the same way. So the upper left there, that's a cover crop. Um, you can see we chopped down and getting ready to spade that in. We have uh, chickens now. We have a couple of laying flocks. They've been really great, especially to add um, some quality phosphorus to our soil where we can. We'll put them in a cover crop and let them graze on it and eat it down. Down here, we do a lot of hay mulching, you know, got grass fed vegetables, and we buy uh, compost from Missouri Organic on a regular basis. We feel pretty lucky that we're in a community where we can have uh, finished compost delivered to the farm by the truckloads. So um, that's a real advantage. So we also add some other amendments. You know, we make our own compost. Uh, we use that mainly in the greenhouse. We do buy some bagged fertilizer from Fertrell, what they call their Super N. Uh, it has things like feather meal in it and uh, uh, dried chicken compost, things like that. We use fish emulsion to help um, when we do our, our plantings and occasionally we will fertigate with it. And we also add a lot of uh, minerals. Um, so we did a lot of liming when we first started. We limed our, the entire um, farm where we're, that we're using. Uh, we'll add gypsum that helps add some sulfur, uh, rock phosphate, solubor, which is boron, um, sulfur, you know, zinc. So we'll get our soil tested on a regular basis. And those are some of the micronutrients like the, the zinc and the sulfur and the boron that it says that we need. And there are things like beets that really need boron to, to germinate well. And so some of these um, minerals, they're like vitamins. So if you look at this as the soil is like a person, we're adding the vitamins and the compost is like a ferment and the cover crops are like our roughage. So uh, it's just good to have a lot of diversity in what you feed your soil. We said feed it a regular meal. So you grow your cover crop, you know, you chop it down. <clears throat> we have a flail mower. So flail mowers are nice. They're, it's a, uh, it's um, on a horizontal bar. And so it chops stuff and lays it right down in place. Um, it doesn't just kind of like whir it around like in a blender. And then we uh, chew it in. So this is our spader. Terry was talking about that a little bit. And, you know, it's basically a set of shovels and uh, there's kind of a reciprocating um, motion. So this will spin pretty fast and it kind of digs down and kicks out towards us. And you run that down the bed and it, it uh, doesn't really create a, a hard pan at the bottom of your plow line or your till line because it's just stabbing into the soil. So it's like double digging with a bunch of shovels. Um, and it's kind of about the, we only really use it anymore to uh, uh, dig in cover crops. So that's why I call it our chewing step more than our tilling step. Um, we try to use chickens and then we have a field cultivator just to, to cultivate a lot of ground um, between other uses and really just work to only have our need to really chop stuff into the ground when we do cover crops. And so talking about how it's like uh, a human that's 
that eats, you know, the fourth step is kind of, you know, domesticate it. You know, you need to add some water. Water is critical to, to life on earth. You know, if you ever tried turning stuff in in a high tunnel, you know, you can see it doesn't degrade quite the same as if you had, um, you know, rain. And so you just need the water. And yeah, you do that. And after a while, it, um, most of this just kind of disappears into the soil. Um, it's nice, we do have some kind of, um, especially this is some sorghum sedan grass, a lot of that residue takes a while to break down. So that's nice to not only have it degrade and turn into humus, but also kind of have some bigger pieces that kind of stick around. We promote a lot of biodiversity on our farm too. We've been planting more and more insectaries. If we have a little strip next to our beds, we'll put down you know, buckwheat or um, uh, dill, cilantro, phacelia, um, well, zinnias, you know, old vegetable seeds that, you know, are brassicas that'll flower. So those really help to bring in the, the beneficial insects. Um, we plant alyssum in the high tunnel a lot. And we feel we're finally to, starting to really see a benefit from this. Uh, I think the main thing is that, you know, you can read about some of these things and do it and uh, you don't necessarily get immediate results. You might draw in um, the beneficials that you want, but you do this three, four or five years over and over and they start to, their eggs are in your high tunnel. You just build up more of a population of beneficials and you've built up your diversity. And so that helps a lot. So this is a graph of our soil organic matter data. Um, we've been keeping track of this pretty much since the start, not with the intent of having this graph, but um, you know, there's some gaps in when we took samples, um, but it shows a trend. You can see, you know, we started back here in 2002 and we were between two and a half and 3% organic matter in our soil. And it actually started to go down some as we, over the first five years, we were having some pretty good crops, you know, a little bit later on here. But it just, it was, our farm was farmed conventionally and it really had to be um, woken up and brought back to life. You know, kind of look at it as um, kind of a bombed out city. You know, there weren't a lot of people living there and all the buildings were were kind of, that weren't doing so hot. So adding a lot of cover crops, and even those the first few years, it took a while for them to even germinate well. Um, you just, you know, you bring back the, um, the aggregation, you know, like Dan was talking about, it's a place where the microorganisms to live. So you, you know, you build back up your infrastructure, you add more organic matter and you build more life, more population, and it just takes a while. So one thing that, you know, we're, trying to run a farm and uh, have viable business. And, but we're also hoping this is kind of a bit of a demonstration of um, what it can take to, to go from conventional to organic. Uh, it takes time and um, you can't expect it all to happen overnight. This is our data in kind of a tabular form. Just uh, like I said, I know some people have seen our graph before and might wonder where their data comes from. So we've had different labs. Um, the main one's been Midwest, and then we went to ANL Labs, which is now Waypoint, and then MU did some testing up here and there. And so our graph, you know, we we take soil samples in one area one year, another another, and just here and there. And so this is not a um, you know a, a research study or anything like that, but it is um, a summary of of our data. And you can see here, like in the range of values, as we got to, um, you know, about our 10th year or so, it took at least that much. Our number, our ranges started even going up, you know, and we started the last few years, we actually had 5% in a couple of our samples. So we feel pretty good about that. Um, whether we can keep going up, you can see that our numbers appear to have kind of leveled off. I think they'll be able to go higher than that in the long run. This table, this column on the right is a, a average of 
the previous three years um, to kind of smooth out the data. And um, we just, yeah, we want to see if we can keep going up. Uh, another thing is that with a graph like this, you know, you can kind of estimate how much carbon has been sequestered because organic matter or is a certain amount carbon, carbon is a certain amount, or carbon dioxide has a certain amount of carbon in it. You can go through different calculations. And uh, with us, kind of as a rough estimate, we see that we've, that we've uh, sequestered about 50,000 pounds of carbon a year over the last, each of the last 10 years. And we've also um, basically built a good 10 to 15, um, thousand pounds of organic matter on our five acres, six acres that we're um, sampling and, and doing our cover cropping on. So I feel that's significant too, because um, we've actually added life to our farm, quite literally, life that would outlive us. You know, you can grow a tomato plant and, you know, you, you sell the tomatoes, that's you know, there's life in that tomato, and um, but it kind of goes off the farm and goes away, and uh, it's kind of history at that point. But the soil, it's um, it's real, it's there, and it has a lot of value. You know, that's one thing we want to try and make a point: is that taking carbon out of the air should have some value, and bringing life onto the earth uh, should have some value. And so, those are some of the things that we feel are important about this type of farming. Um, I think another thing too is that, you know, this shows that, uh, uh, like I said, it's not, this isn't hippie to be thinking, this is like real life um, uh, improving of the um, soil on our farm. And it also adds flavor, you know, we have our ferments and we feel that the flavor of our ferments are reflected in the uh, amount of organic matter that we've sequestered and built up on our farm. So another thing, you know, uh, we need to protect our soil. That's one of the things we're working on right now. Carrie was mentioning that, and um, we really have a problem with water management, and we feel like we really couldn't go on farming the same way we have um, using the kind of the layout that we have. We thought about tile drain and all sorts of stuff, but really hadn't wanted to do that. Rebecca kind of uh, got a lead on this uh, book by Mark Shepard, Restoration Agriculture, uh, where he talks about really, like it says, a real wor world permaculture for farmers. He has a 105 acre permaculture farm. Um, he also has a book called Water for Any Farm, which is an update of the book on the left by uh, P.A. Yeomans. Um, which also is kind of a, a permaculture water management um, guide. And it's a little hard to, um, it, it's kind of technical. And uh, we were lucky enough that he was at a workshop in December of last year. And so like a couple of weeks after we got his restoration ag book and started really digging in it and saying that's kind of got to be the method we should use, we were able to go to a workshop. And so we went to the workshop. We decided that is what we have to do. Um, and we kind of started on it. So one thing we were lucky enough to have is this uh, LIDAR um, topo map uh, that we got from our local USDA office. And this is beautiful, you know, this overlay of our contours right on um, where our fields are today. Um, like I said, I used to be an engineer, so some of these things I, I more or less knew what he was talking about, but applying it to our farm was a little, we were unsure for a while, but then um, kind of decided we could do it. And so these are just some kind of sketches as we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. So we came out with our layout and we decided this is the first week of March. So it, it was dry. We got this two bottom plow working. And so we just uh, went at it. And um, just like 
Carrie was saying that the only thing they use a two bottom plow for is digging ditches. Well, that's what we did about a mile over a mile's worth. And so you can see the two bottom plow, what it does is it cuts a ditch and it throws soil up into a little hill, which is the berm. And um, that's kind of all you need to do to form your um, berms and soils. And so this was early on, it started raining. We were kind of lucky we got everything in or most everything in um, before a rain and then we got to kind of see how it was working. So the slide before you could see, um, it's, it's dry up here, that's um, higher up. And so the water was flowing down here to these ridges. You can see here where, where these uh, swales kind of form a C tends to be where the ridges are because the whole idea is that you want to bring water from your valleys where it would normally rush off the farm and create gullies and erosion to your ridges, which are your, your higher spots that um, they can dry out quicker and you probably want more water there. And so instead of having like water run down a gully, you know, here to go off the farm for 150 feet, you have these long um, swales where you can snake the water through your farm. And so all the water that falls on your farm, you capture more or less one way or the other and you slow it down. So that's what we did there. You can kind of, you can see that here too. So you can see that here's a swale, here's a berm actually with a straw on it. Uh, we, we seeded it um, and put straw down on them. Uh, this spring and this is a ridge so this is a high point and you can see things have started to dry out but it's actually got a wet spot on there so it appears that a lot of what we did has been successful um, in that point here's something about you know a week ago so here's the swale through here and here's the berm that we threw the soil and so things are starting to grow up um, this is just a picture of some barley and, and uh, red clover in the area. We have a lot of areas that we had cover crop to kind of hold them. And it's just a pretty time of year for cover crops. So another thing that we have done um, is to um, subsoil. So that's another recommendation for uh, the, the type of, um, for the swales and berms. And so the subsoil are basically, this is a pretty heavy duty piece of steel. You don't want to buy oop, one of these from just uh, the hardware store. Um, this is 1200 bucks, which isn't too bad. Um, and this will go down 18 inches. So we have about 10 inches of topsoil maybe in some of our better areas. And when it rains, rains you know, five, 10 inches at a time in a week, um, the water just doesn't have a chance to run off and the roots of our plants get submerged and like Carrie was saying, they don't have any air and uh, they're going to die. And we got a little tired of that with some of the wet periods we've had. And so we were looking not just to spread the water across the farm horizontally, but vertically. And so there's, you need a 50 horsepower just to pull this one shank through the ground. and um, you basically do it parallel to the swales. So we have 40 foot alleys between our swales and we can drive our tractor maybe six, seven times um, parallel. So if we have over a mile worth of, sw of swales, we will have over five or six miles worth of subsoiling, which we were hoping will help us a lot. Here you can see it's buried pretty deep um, and there you can see Rebecca, her arm could go down even farther into that. So we're, it's kind of interesting. We haven't really had a big rain since we did all this. Um, so someday we'll see how well it worked. Um, but the, the land is changing and we're really pretty happy with it. So uh, one of our CSA members had a really he has a pretty good drone. This is like, you know, he's like, oh, I'll send it up to 500 feet. And got this picture of um, half of our farm. And this is kind of what I was really hoping we could get before 
um, we got too far along. It really shows we're going from rectangular to curvilinear. You know, we were acting like we were on a creek bottom and we're not. And so anybody that's on a hill um, that's farming, I would recommend uh, thinking about doing some more contour like farming where there's still some areas we're not quite sure how we want to manage them. Um, this area here is what's called a saddle and that this ridge runs down this way, another ridge runs down to it and then it drops off on two directions. And so it's a little feature we didn't even really know until we started uh, doing this. Um, so the long-term plan, you know, isn't annual vegetables. Um, according to restoration agriculture. Uh, you know, we, we still have annual vegetables and we will for a while, but we're gonna start planting trees and shrubs on the swales. The idea is things like chestnuts and um, <clears throat> pawpaws and elderberries and hazelnuts. And we have chickens, so you can see here, here's one of our chicken yards. Um, we have two movable coops. So we can run them through the alleys. Um, but ideally you want, you know, your cattle followed by birds and maybe followed by sheep or, so there's kind of a whole uh, kind of progression that you, at least that Mark Shepard who wrote Restoration and Agriculture does on his farm. So whether we get to that point, we're still in the planning stages. Some of our planning too, right? You know, even just still involves um, our layout. So these white lines, these is, this is an in-ground irrigation system that we have. Um, this orange line is kind of a, a road path that we have around it. And, you know, we're trying to figure out, well, what if you want to get into here? You know, are we going to have another road go along some of these berms? Or So there's a, still a lot for us to learn. So stay tuned, see what's going on there. Um, I think I have a few more minutes too. Uh, I added a couple more slides here. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our high tunnel management and how it's kind of progressed to a, a no-till situation. So we got a high tunnel back in 2012 and uh, we use it for season extension for our CSA. We don't do any summer cash crop growing in it. <clears throat> it's mainly so we can start a CSA season early and have it go until closer to Thanksgiving. Um, so I don't know why we didn't do any analysis prior to 2015, but the main thing I wanna show here is that we, um, we've seen a, a, a really good increase, especially since um, in these last three or four years when we've been running chickens through the high tunnel, increase in our phosphorus. You know, we do add rock phosphate and things like that to our soil, but uh, this year our spinach stayed green basically until now with that, with, you know, without a lot of um, additional amendments going into the high tunnel. Um, you can see our pH is about the same. Our organic matter is finally starting to go up. You know, yeah, build a high tunnel. We had to kind of scoop out earth to the side of it to build it up. So it was kind of a cut and fill operation. So there's subsoil in there. So it's taken us a while to really improve the quality of the soil. And we feel that the chickens has helped a lot. So just to kind of run through a season real quick. So here's like April, we're harvesting for the first week of the CS day. Uh, May, we're looking to do this tomorrow. Um, we turn about 70 or so chickens loose in there. We'll park the trailer at the one end and we'll block off the other end. And they'll just go to town on whatever's left in the high tunnel. Um, and so, yeah, it'll look like this by the time they're gone. Uh, then we'll come in here with a um, field cultivator and kind of rough up the soil. We bought an overhead irrigation system from a, a fellow farmer last year, and that's really helped a lot with um, managing the high tunnel. So yeah, we would cultivate it, put down um, 
mainly just cowpeas. Um, it's a soft tissue plant, so that helps a lot. You know, we used to put Sudan grass in there and it would grow up to the rafters and we'd come in with our spader and spade it in. And I don't know, it was just things were too chunky when you did that for one. So July, we'll have our cover crop. This is our electric um, tractor. You can see here, we uh, built an attachment to put discs on it. So just like those, um, uh, the, the BCS that'll um, make, make a raised bed, we use this to make our raised beds. And so we mow down the, um, the cow peas, and then you can kind of see here, we have our gutters, so we have five beds in here. We shape the beds. Uh, we irrigate it with the overhead irrigation, and then we cover it with the tarp. You know, there's uh, uh, Jean-Luc, um, or Jean-Martin Fortier, um, his, his method with the tarp, we do that a lot. Um, it's, it's been a pretty helpful method to manage weeds. And then we take it off in September and the beds are shaped. They're literally ready to plant the day we take the tarp off. And then we plant. So we've gotten to the point pretty much where we don't have to till the high tunnel at all. Um, the overhead watering has helped a lot. We, you know, the um, water costs money. That's kind of, the, you know, there's an expense associated with that, but we feel that to occasionally give some overhead water to the high tunnel really improves the um, quality of the vegetables. And I think it's just really helping life in the soil there throughout the entire square footage of the high tunnel kind of come to life. And um, I think that's about it. I could talk about a lot more um, as to why we're doing things and some of the other details, but I'll just uh, leave time for questions here.